Okay, today is November 17th and we're gonna make some mead. This is all of the supplies that you were going to need to make the mead, but not all of it today. So I'm just gonna go through, give a rundown of the supplies you need. This is a two gallon must bucket, M-U-S-T, must bucket. This is, everything is gonna go into this and create your must. This is a one gallon glass carboy with the top with the hole in it for your aerator. This is your aerator, which will go in top in the top of that hole eventually. You'll fill it with water up to the line. It allows the fermentation process to percolate out without any air going in. You want this to be as airtight as possible. This will also fit into the bung on the top of your must bucket. There's the bung rubber bung, which creates an airtight seal. They also sell them individually, so if that one ever dry rots, you can buy a replacement for it. So all of your ingredients will go into here initially. You will need a sanitizer. We have Star San, which makes a little cap full of it. Just this little amount over here makes a whole gallon. And then we put it into a spray bottle sanitizer. We sanitize everything and we do it repeatedly. We sanitize our counter, all of our, our buckets, our carboys, our measuring cups, everything inside and outside of our aerator, our hydrometer when we when we use that. Everything gets sanitized, our, sanitized, our hands, everything. If it accidentally touches something after we sanitize it, we re-sanitize it. So you will, this will be your friend. Honey, we buy one gallon jugs of it at a local apiary. It's uh, in more of a raw form. It will have some natural yeast that goes with it. Which brings up the Campton tablets. We put one of these in there to kill the natural yeast. I've been told that the natural yeast is not good for you, can make you sick. So you put one of these in there and it kills it. However, we did make Freya's Torar mead and it had some of the natural fermentation process start when we added in the yeast we just added to it and here I stand so take that and do with it what you will the yeast we use a Lavlin D47 it is a 12% yeast it yields 12% however do not strictly go by 12% yeast feeds off of sugar it needs the sugar to activate it. We have gotten anywhere from the 12% the yeast, a 14 to 15% yield, which means it's 28 to 30 proof on our mead, and that's fine. We did make an 18%. We didn't see that much of an increase in the alcohol percentage, so we just stick with the 12% D47 Lavlin. Raisins, I don't have any raisins right here right now, but raisins, we cut, we take 25 raisins and we cut them in half, 50 pieces of raisins. They go into the must bucket with everything else and it's just a slower timed release of the sugars. That's all they're in there for. The yeast is gonna burn through your honey. Simple sugars, it's gonna go through it really fast. You will have the, the sugars that are in your fruit. Those are also simple sugars. All you're doing is providing more sugars for the yeast to ferment on, which then produce, produces your alcohol. The vanilla bean. We use a vanilla bean in there because it smooths everything out. We don't even put a whole vanilla bean in there. We cut the vanilla bean in half and we cut it open and we scrape out the inside. We put the inside and then we throw the whole vanilla bean stalk right in there. This makes for a very smooth tasting mead. So, Today's mead is going to be, well, wait a minute, I did forget some of the things in my bucket. These will come in handy down the line, or uh, needed down the line. Bottle caps and a capper, okay? You will need some bottles, whether it be wine bottles or beer bottles, to put this stuff into. So we have uh, used St. Pauli's Girl German beer with a pop top. You can't use a twist top, it will not work. So St. Pauli's Girl bottle, we uh, consume the beer and we sanitize the bottles. 
one, one full musk bucket will give you approximately one gallon of mead, which will give you about 10 St. Pauli Girl beer bottle full of mead to consume. These pop on with your tapper tool onto your beer bottle. This is a spring-loaded device to fill, fill your beer bottle. You put that in there, and the way this is designed, when you push down, the alcohol flows into it, and when you take this out of your beer bottle, then you displace enough of the alcohol so it drops down just enough where everything works fine and the equation is right. This is a siphon. You will need a siphon to get it to go from this must bucket into your glass carboy. When you do it, you want to keep as much of the debris in the, this bucket. The lees will stay in this bucket. We'll get to that when we get ready to do it. I'm just showing you the stuff that you're going to need. With your hydrometer, mine came with a little chart that shows the conversion tables once you, once you rack your mead into your carboy the first time and your flexible hosing for doing all of your transfers, which will hook up to the ends of your devices. This is all, everything hooks up together and you'll use them all at different times. Today's mead, we're making an apple vanilla mead and we're calling it Dura Mjathar. Dura Mjathar. It's D, the hyphenated Y, or not hyphenated, but accented Y. The R-A, Dura, Old North, Norse. If you type it into a translator, it's going to say Dira. But the accented Y, it carries the U sound. Ooh, like uh, just that accented Y by itself is Ooh, the U tree. Ooh tree. So we're calling it, you can call it Dira Mjathar if you want, or you can call it Dura Mjathar. And what the etymology of deer is it's a newer word so what this mead actually means is dura is a wild beast not like cattle or, or a, a domesticated animal this is dura mjathar your wild beast mjathar mead so let's get started and we'll make us some mead make us some must okay first step into our must bucket, which has been sanitized, our measuring cup, which has been sanitized, and our rubber spatula, which has been sanitized, is we're adding six and two thirds cups of uh, wild honey, wildflower uh, honey to it. Now, there's a reason I put the honey in first, and I'm very meticulous about how much. I measure out. If you don't scrape it down in between each time that you do a measurement on your honey, then you're not actually getting your six and two thirds cups, which equals five pounds of honey. So there's a reason we put the honey in first because that honey has to dissolve. You don't want it just to sit on the bottom of your must bucket. We're gonna add a full gallon of water to this must bucket with our fruit and all that kind of stuff. The way I do that is I take eight cups of hot water from here, dump it in, measure it out, eight cups of hot water. So that way I stir it around real good and melt that honey. Then I put seven more cups of cooler water with my fruit and all that in there. Now that doesn't equal a gallon. I keep one cup out, so it's a total of 16, but I take keep one cup out so that way tomorrow when I add in my yeast, I can dissolve my yeast into that one cup of warm water. So you'll have a total of 16 cups in here. But we need the hot water in here to melt that honey. That's the next step. And one thing I forgot to, to mention, when you clean this plastic must bucket, do not use something so abrasive that it's gonna scratch the inside. You do not want any material to get gunked up. That's an official word, gunk, into those grooves and then give your meat a bad taste. You want this to be nice and smooth. If you notice any gouges in there, throw it away, get a new must bucket. Okay, I've got my eight cups of hot water. You can see it's brought it up to about here. Okay, and I've, I've stirred in that hot water and it's pretty much dissolved my honey up. It's looking really good. This here is a Campton tablet. Kind of looks like a, a aspirin. Take two spoons, 
which have been sanitized, both of them, and you want to crush that Campton tablet. So you just kind of go like this and crush that tablet. So you have a nice powder, and then that goes right into your must. And then you pretty much, you're done with your spoons. Mix that right in. Next, we'll uh, slice in half our 15 raisins. Any raisins, we use brown raisins, and we'll put them in here, and then we're gonna add our apples. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, we're using a uh, Macintosh apple. Uh, we looked for Empire, which we think are the best, but we couldn't find any. So we're using a Macintosh apple. We're not using anything overly sweet. These are our second favorite apple. So I'm going to cut these up and uh, put them into our must bucket. I usually see that on videos. It's supposed to hit the cutting board and be a pile of apples, but that didn't work. Okay, that was one apple. We're shooting for four cups, at least four cups of apples. And uh, the cutting board was sanitized. Both knives are sanitized. Um, so throwing it up in the air and having it cut fall down as sliced pieces didn't work the way I see in those food videos. So we're doing it the old fashioned way here. Okay, this is our vanilla bean, half of our vanilla bean, and I'm going to get, I got to kind of dissect it here. There we go. We ended up going with five cups of apples in this instead of the four. And, uh, because I, I had them cut. I want this to be very apple-y. Well, that's going in there too, so we're putting the whole stock and everything in, so. And we mixed it once. It still only has the eight cups of water in there. I'm going to add in the other seven momentarily. And then tomorrow I'm going to add in my yeast with the final cup, making 16 cups of water, which is one gallon. And then the reason you're doing this in such a, a bigger bucket is because by the time you put all your your fruit and your other ingredients in there you have displaced the amount of water in the bucket so you actually need a bigger bucket than one gallon so i'm gonna say that's good good enough you just want to be able to have that mead that vanilla bean get dispersed throughout the liquid and then we're going to mix this around a little bit and Add in our other cup, seven cups of cooler water. Okay, I've got the other seven cups of cool water in here, just uh, regular tap water temperature. And what I'm doing now is I am not only mixing everything together, but I'm creating air bubbles on the inside. Now I do this for five minutes on just the must with the 15 cups of of water and then I'm going to do it again tomorrow for five minutes after I add the yeast in and that'll give me my full 16 cups of, of water and then I want to make sure I have good air bubbles flowing through and get that uh, yeast mixture all mixed in good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this D47 Lavalin tonight I'm going to put it into a cup of warm water and I'm going to set it off to the side with some aluminum foil loosely put over the top of uh, a little mason jar. That way, tomorrow morning when I get up and I add the yeast to it, it's going to be good and soft. It's not going to be just going in there as a, as a powdered yeast. Okay, I took one cup of warm water and I put my yeast in. You only want warm water. You don't want hot because you don't want to kill your yeast. That set off, that top is barely on there just to keep any dust out but that should not act, uh, activate because there's no sugars it's just going to soften that's why I used a new measuring cup in case there was any residual honey left in there I did not want that yeast to activate overnight I'm now this has been mixed for my five minutes my cover which is sanitized 
I am putting my cover on. Now, little, little tricks here, okay? Your bung, put it away from your handle because your aerator is going to stick up. If you put it on like this, it's going to hit the aerator. So put your bung away from your handle and get that locked into position. Okay. All right. Now, this is my, my aerator. This is, The whole countertop here has been sanitized. I have not sanitized this yet. So I'm going to go outside, inside, and that goes right here. Okay, the next piece. We'll go down there. I have already sanitized this little measuring cup. Now there is a line on here, it's very difficult to see. But you want to fill that up. That little cap is going to float some. And that is where you're going to stop. Okay. And, all right, let everything settle out. Add a little bit more to that. Right there, good. Okay. That'll allow things to percolate up. It's not, it's not going to. It shouldn't percolate because that Campton tablet is killing all of the wild yeast that's in there. That's not going to percolate till tomorrow when we add this. And then it takes anywhere from 8 to 12 hours. It's going to start bubbling. You can watch, you'll watch the bubbles percolate right up through this thing. And it's going to get up to about maybe every three seconds you're going to see a bubble coming. The, the better it's activated, the faster that's going to bubble. So what we're going to do for now is we're going to put this into a dark space. And cool, doesn't have to be warm. And we're going to let it sit until tomorrow morning. We're going to carry it out here. We're going to dump our yeast in, re-aerate it for five minutes, and then it goes back in there for one month. So we will not touch that bucket until December 17th or December 18th. We're going to let it sit there. We're going to keep an eye on our aerator to make sure it always has water in it over the course of that month. And then we gently carry it out and we put it back here. So after tomorrow, this thing gets ignored for four weeks. Okay, it's Monday, November 18th. And we're going to add in our yeast mixture right here. You can see what it looks like, kind of milky soft. And I'm just going to dump that entire thing right in there. And then we are going to aerate this for five minutes, making sure we get good air pushed down through like I did yesterday. And then I'm going to put my Resanitize my top, resanitize my aerator, and put the water back in the aerator, put it in the pantry, and uh, it's going to sit there for a month. And I'm just going to keep a check on the water level of the aerator. If the water level gets down, add a little bit to the top of it and just let it percolate. Okay, I added in the yeast and I actually put everything all back on, the cover all sanitized and everything, put it back in the pantry, and then remembered. I, I forgot to do the hydrometer reading. So this is my hydrometer. It's already been sanitized. I put it right into the bucket. And I want you to film up close up here. And what you do is you put it in there and then you want to spin it like that. What that does is it ensures it gets all the air bubbles off the hydrometer so you get yourself an accurate reading on there. And then we're going to go by the, the blue scale and the blue scale reads 1.124 and I'll pull that out it was 1.124 and that's where it was sitting inside the must so that's going to be our initial reading that we're going to use to get our alcohol percentage later on now I'm going to re-sanitize everything and put it all back together and put it in the pantry for a month and keep an eye on my uh, aerator water level. Okay, it's November 19th and it's about 9.30 in the morning. And I'm just doing a quick video of our aerator here. Our meat has started to ferment and we're anywhere between 14 seconds and 18 seconds on the bubbles. They will speed up to be anywhere between 3 and 5 seconds apart. But, uh, I'm just going to monitor that water level right there that you see over the course of the month, and we're going to let this thing do its magic.
make us some mead. Durum yathar. Okay, today is Friday the 24th of January, 2020. We're doing our initial rack on our apple mead. And uh, we're a little bit late on the timetable of when we wanted to have it racked, but we had a lot going on. So what we did is we just made sure we kept uh, water in our aerator and that protects the mead from having air get to it and ruining your mead. So we're gonna do our first rack now. We have our carboy set up. We have our siphon going in. This end of the hose is at a 45 degree angle and it goes into your carboy. You have the, this table lower than the counter and it goes into our siphon. Now, when we put our siphon into the bucket, we want to go down to the bottom, but we want to come off the bottom a little bit because we don't want to get the lees into the carboy, the glass carboy. As we fill up the carboy, we're going to get some of the lees or sediment that goes in there. This is why you do another rack to get the, the purity of the mead, but you don't want to get the big chunks and you're going to try to stop that uh, before that happens. We may have to end up tipping this bucket a little bit as, as we go to make sure we keep getting the mead. So I'm just going to get our siphon going here. Does that ever fall out? And we're flowing. It doesn't take a lot. And when you carry, when you carry your must bucket out, you want to carry it out as gently as possible because it's been sitting there. Everything has settled. You want to make sure it stays settled. You want to stir that up. You're trying to get as pure of mead out of this bucket and into this carboy as possible. So you're going to very gently set it onto the counter. You're going to very gently work your siphon and try not to disturb what's in this must bucket. Now I can see in through this glass tubing, I can see that we're still flowing smoothly. This two gallon must bucket is going to give us one gallon of mead and in the carboy. And it's going to be cloudy. And then when we rack it again, it'll give us a much more pure um, mead with no leaves in it because we're going to take them out of this one. And... Uh, it should give us a total yield of about 10 bottles. It's a little over half on the carboy. All right, I can start to see the black end of the siphon. Now this may give us more than a gallon into this carboy, which is why we stage a couple glasses that way we can do a little pre-taste test as well and see how it's turning out. It's going to take taste a little bit more bitter off with this first rack here because of the cloudiness does add a little bit of uh, bitter taste to it. Okay, we filled our carboy all the way up to the top with, with the meat from our must bucket. We'll show you what's in the must bucket left over in a minute. This is our hydrometer. This is going to give you our ending specific gravity. Now, when you filled it up to the top, when we put that in there, it does have some overflow, but it's easier to read it with the mead all the way at the top. So that's why we do that. Let put a rag underneath it, let it let it overflow. So once you put it in there, it's going to buoy, and then you want to spin it to get the air off of it. You want to make sure you get as accurate as a reading as possible. Now we use our wine scale. There's another scale on here called the beer scale. And we are at 1.01 1 .018. That's our finished specific gravity. Now we'll compare that on our chart to our beginning specific gravity. And that's going to give us our alcohol content. Okay, we've done our calculations on November 17th is when we made our wild beast mead, a deer uh, miathar, and the percentage before fermentation came out to be, it was a 1.124 on our hydrometer. Today, after fermentation, it's 
2.3 on our hydrometer. That's what 1.018 equals. We have a chart right here that came with the hydrometer and it's got how to do the calculations on the back. What you do according to the calculations, you take the 16.2% and the 2.3%, you subtract them, you've got 13.9% alcohol content in this bottle, in this carboy of mead. 13.9, you multiply that by 2 to get your proof. So this mead right here as it sits is 27.8 proof mead. It will stay at that even after we rack it the next time. We have racked, or we have done the hydrometer at the, the different stages further in the process and it never changes after this initial rack. This is what is left in the bottom of your must bucket. This is all the, the apple depleted of its nutrients and sugars. This was, this is what was in the bottom of that, uh, that siphon. You can see how it's got that little groove cut in it and you just gently pull that up. Now we filled that carboy up, which we're gonna put another airlock on there. We're gonna set that away for hopefully only three to four weeks. Let the leaves settle, and then we're gonna rack it one more time into another carboy. After this became full, we were able to get three glasses. This was the first glass. So this is the closest in what's going to be in here to match. I'm going to try to pass my hand behind it. You can see how it's cloudy. That's how it's going to look after your first rack. Okay, that was the first class. This is the second. And then I'm going to hold up the third. And this was the third. So it makes substantially more than one gallon. Now let me do it this way. You can see if one is more cloudy compared to the other. It looks like the bigger glass is even more cloudy because we were getting toward the bottom of the bucket more. So more of our lees, our sediment, got sucked up into it. But it'll have a bitter taste because of that lees. Actually, actually, that's pretty good. But anyway, school. And this is our first rack of Deirdre Melthar. Okay, today is Saturday, February 15th. And we've very gently carried our glass carboy of Diro Miathar out to the counter. And you want to move these things very gently because you don't want to disturb the leaves. You can see the leaves are on the bottom right in here, settled. Now this is clarified quite a bit. I'll pass my hand behind it. We're going to rack it into another glass carboy and we're going to see if it needs to settle some more or if it's ready to bottle. Okay, we've got everything sanitized. We've got our siphon, the hose, inside and out. We've got our carboy washed and then sanitized. Now, we're gonna start the siphon process into this other carboy. I just wanna explain something about the sanitizer. You will have some little residual bubbles that are in the carboy and in the, in the tubing, things like that. It's fine, it doesn't hurt you. You wanna to try to get them out the best you can, but it's, it's not gonna hurt you if they're in there when you put the meat in. So we're gonna very gently start the siphon process. You don't want to push the siphon down in too far to begin with because remember you're displacing the mead as you push down and you don't want to have it overflow. There we go. Now I put it on these silicone pot holders again because as it gets down there farther we don't want to get the lees into the other carboy, but we do want to get as much of the clarified mead as possible. So I may have to tip this first carboy just slightly so I have more depth to what's remaining in the bottom of the carboy. This is the carboy we just transferred into. You'll notice that it's down in volume a little bit more because we stopped siphoning. And I, as it was going down, I, I, I tipped it very gently. Now you see I'm tipping it a lot faster than what I did when I was doing the transfer because those are all your leaves. You can see how, how kind of cloudy they look on the bottom. I, I've stirred up those leaves. And now you have this one here. You can see the clarity as opposed to when we first did the rack. And this is a glass 
that as we got toward the bottom, we transferred it over to here. We didn't want that cloudiness to go into this one. We are not going to bottle this today. We're going to give it about two weeks, and then we're going to bottle it straight into the bottles, and that'll give it enough time to settle out again, and we'll get some nice clarity out of this. So, again, when we transferred it, and we went to tip this, what I did is I kept on feeding the siphon down into the carboy. I started up top, and I just started, I kept on feeding it down as the level dropped, and I just very gently went down like this as the level went down. And then as we got toward the bottom, I tipped it very gently, and I let the siphon come up to where it was the deepest, and I kept on feeding it down. When we got down toward the bottom, I was watching up in this area to see for the cloudiness of the mead. As soon as I saw a little bit of cloudiness, I broke the siphon and we transferred it into the glass. So we're going to put this away for two weeks. We've got our airlock rewashed, sanitized, put back in place with the water filled up. Remember, air is your enemy in here. You do have a little bit in here, but you want to keep out as much as possible. So that's all in place. We have already cheated and taken a sip of this, but I'm going to do another one on film. It is very good. In two weeks, we will have more. Okay, today is Saturday, February 29th, and we were going to do the second rack of Dira Miathar, and we opted to go straight into bottling because of the clarity. And this is the clarity now. And this here is the last that came out of our carboy. So what's in the bottles is even more clear than that. We got a total yield of nine bottles and then those two little glasses right here from that one gallon carboy. As you can see, nine bottles. All right, these are, the browns are gifts and the greens are ours. So nine bottles, one gallon does not take you very far, especially if you start giving some away as gifts. Now I want to explain what we did when we bottled it. It's, it's a two person job, so we had to bottle it first. What I did is I filled this up. Now this is an extra accessory if you want to get it. It's, it's a, you put the meat in there after you rack it on your first rack from your must container into here. You can put some of the meat into here and then you can put your hydrometer into there. I've already shown how to do that hydrometer. So you can buy this if you want. It's just an extra doodad. You don't really need it. But I filled this all the way up to the top with water. When you bottle the mead into the bottles, you will fill that mead all the way up to the top because then when... As, Push, pushing down because then as you take it out it displaces that much and you'll see on the mead bottles that it is down that little bit so this here is has a spring in it so when you go to clean it you have to be careful of that little spring that's inside it has a spring in there and that's how the whole thing functions if you lose that spring you're gonna have to buy yourself a new bottle the storing of these bottles, we reuse them, as except for the browns, we're going to give them away. When you store them, we rinse them out, wash them out, and then sanitize them, and then we turn them upside down. That way when they're stored, they don't have a, a puddling of water on the bottom that will eventually mildew. Um, this, we just made, this is a, a bung that we just ordered, and we had to make the opening the hole for it on our five gallon bucket a little bit bigger. You have to be careful when you have other people drill the hole because this is tapered. What you wanna do is, is when you drill your hole, you wanna drill it just a little bit longer than this lower end. So that way when you push it in, you get an airtight seal around that and then your, your aerator goes in through the top. So we're gonna film a little bit of the bottling or the, the capping here. With the, with the caps, when you buy them, you want to make sure you have that little oxygen barrier in there. Oxygen, remember, is your, that's your enemy with the mead. So, 
what you do is you place the cap on there. Your capper has got a magnet in here. Now listen, you'll, you'll hear it click up into place. You hear that? Okay, then you bring that down very gently. That grabs the neck. Okay, I'm gonna take it off. It's in there on the magnet. Bring this down. That grabs the neck of the bottle and then push down until you feel it give. And then take it off and your first bottle is capped. Put it on the top. Put this down. Let it grab the neck. So you feel it give and you're good. And you keep going on them until you're done. But we just mixed up a five gallon bucket of another mead. So that should give us that much more of a yield. And uh, that is the process of making mead. And this is Jira Mjathar. And it is good. We just finished racking Dira Mjothar, Wild Beast Mead. It's an apple mead, and it's got a very nice apple taste to it. Very smooth uh, for how high of a percentage alcohol there is, which is almost 30% or 30 proof alcohol. It There's no burn to it. It's a very soft, mild taste. It's a beautiful mead for fall. Come Samhain. This will be uh, a good mead to sip on. Clarity is there. It tastes wonderful. And it's a mead that if you're not careful, it will sneak up on you. So, school, slancha, nastrovia.